So give us the strength to make the tough decisions we must face. Guide us with your wisdom. Bless us with your light. Pray so. Pray so. Soul never said that it would be easy colonizing this world, did he? No. So we must focus on serving him, right? Yes, we should. So that means we must stay pure. That means you must stay away from that atheist kid, okay? Okay. Good boy. The door. I'm Holly Fry, and welcome to Raised by Wolves, the podcast, where groundbreaking minds discuss some of the real-life research behind the science featured in the HBO Max sci-fi series, Raised by Wolves. To get started in Level Set, these new episodes that just came out served us up a whole platter of hot reveals like pancakes, a big one being that for all of the science in this show, there actually might be some truth to all of that Mithraic mystery yet. The thing that really kind of blew my mind and made me rethink what I thought I understood about the show is the appearance of Ghost Tally. I'm like, what, uh, what's going on here? So <laughs> wow, Raised by Wolves is the kind of series that tends to generate more questions than it answers. On this companion podcast, we can at least try to help you understand some of the real-life tech, science, and history that inspired the series. And with Saul recently showing up a lot more than most Raised by Wolves characters are used to, even the devoutly religious ones, and perhaps especially them, we thought this would be the perfect time to discuss the real cult of Mithras. This was a sun-worshipping religious sect that the show's faith is based on, and to look at how religion might shape our own future. Mithras, or Mithra, or Mitra, depending on who you ask, was a sun god whose worship is, at the very earliest, assigned to the Persians around 400 BCE. And the story goes that after Alexander the Great conquered Persia, that god's influence spread and he became more popular throughout the ancient world. This is actually debated, but what is known is that between the 1st and 5th century CE, the cult of Mithras bloomed as an underground religious movement, worshipping this bull-slaying sun god. And in the 4th century, it appears that at least to some degree, the cult of Mithras supposedly became the enemy of the still-growing faith of Christianity, because the new Christians saw it as a threat to their growing faith, and there was, spiritually speaking, mad beef. The truth is that while Mithraism involves its own set of religious roles and figures and beliefs, It is really about worshiping the sun, which in a lot of ways should make sense, even to atheists. After all, any scientist would admit that without the sun, we would be nothing. At the same time, history has shown us again and again that faiths often become corrupted by power, which makes us wonder if a modern version of Mithraism or Mithraism, perhaps born just as innocently out of a desire to honor Mother Nature, could become plagued by bureaucracy and corruption as it is in Raised by Wolves. All of this speaks to a larger question. Does religion have a role in mankind's future, and if so, what is it? And what can we learn from an ancient society like the cult of Mithras that will inform the spiritual path of modern-day humanity? But before we tackle these god-sized questions, we have to sit down once again with show creator Aaron Guzikowski to find out how the original, real-life, ancient cult of sun worshippers inspired the religious movement that ultimately ends Earth in Raised by Wolves. Here's Aaron on what led him to embrace this idea of the sacred in space, which his collaborator Ridley Scott has touched on in the past, but has never confronted in such a head-on manner as it's presented in Raised by Wolves. How did you decide that you wanted to make humanity's final survivors essentially a religious army? I knew I wanted to find a religion that was both real but poorly understood. This ancient cult of Mithras, uh, 
as soon as I stumbled on it, it was so interesting just because so little is known about it because uh, everyone who is a member were sworn to secrecy. So they, uh, nobody knows. All they have are these old temples and there are all these underground caves. And there's basically these weird sorts of astrology type drawings on the ceiling. And other than that, they don't know anything. So that was extremely uh, interesting to me. Just the, the, the fact that there was something as poorly understood as that, because it's hard to find things now that haven't been debunked or completely figured out. Now, you start with that very fertile ground because we have information on them, but not enough to make it too restrained. So how did you then develop the Mithraic movement for Raised by Wolves? Well, it's interesting. It takes on sort of a different uh, character as I imagined it, you know, in the future as it happens because we added this kind of new element to it. Okay, there's going to be a, a new religion, even though it's based on an old religion, but it sort of appears, you know, in the 21st century. And somehow they need to eradicate all other competing religions. Well, what would that really require? In this story, they started to realize that there were technical specs encrypted in these scriptures. So if you looked at them a certain way, this actually is instructions for how to build things. And so that's what they started to do. So it's a little bit of a, of, of a combo of the real and the unreal. You know, I think it relates also to the larger mythology of the show. So how much did you actually study the cult of Mithras and its sort of ancient origins? And how far did you let yourself go in terms of shifting that around? Because you made up a whole other element to it. I did. I made up a lot. Some of it I, I crossbred with aspects of Christianity. I did a fair amount of research. They had sort of a different understanding of what Mithraicism was up until like the late 80s. And at that point, someone kind of figured out that all these astrological signs that they were drawing in their caves and whatnot weren't so much about the stories. They actually were representative of the actual stars that are within those constellations. And something called the procession of the equinox, where the universe is actually appearing to move which they started to believe was, you know, the greatest thing a god could do is actually changing the universe. It's quite fascinating. You know, all these temples throughout Europe are these star maps, essentially. You talk about sort of crossbreeding it with Christianity, but I'm wondering what specific elements of sort of modern-day, real-world religious practices you consciously included in their mythology. Sure. Uh, one was communion uh, that we did uh, before they get on the ark. You know, I think there are other aspects that relate a little bit to, you know, the Vatican and this whole, you know, notion of all of the all the trappings and all of the appearance of it all, you know, the the pomp and circumstance that goes along with it. And also the the hierarchy of it all, you know, the popes, the cardinals and all of the the different stations that one can uh, occupy. And I was raised Catholic. I was fascinated and terrified as a child, you know, of being nailed to a cross. <laughs> <laughs> like the idea of having nails driven through your hands and your feet, you know, as a child, you're just like, I don't understand. I remember we had a crucifix hanging up in our hallway, you know, the real with the, with the blood and the whole thing. And there was also, there was that. And then there was the cover of an Ozzy Osbourne album called uh, The Blizzard of Oz. He's like holding a cross. I think there's upside and down crosses. I, all this kind of, you know, swished together in my head and uh, some kind of weird, I, I just always found it terrifying and, and odd, but I liked it. I, I you know, to some aspects of it, I enjoyed. Uh, I, I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, but uh, nor do I have anything against Catholicism, uh, as it were. But, you know, it's kind of the biggest kid in the block. So it's the it's the one you kind of go to when it comes to, uh, you know, if there is uh, a story about a religion trying to take over the world. Well, that's that's kind of what they tried to do. <laughs> So one of my favorite things about this show is this juxtaposition between, obviously, you have the Mithraic who worships Saul and Saul being, you know, a sun, a, a light energy. But you also have the atheist androids who essentially are saying the same thing without all of the mysticism, where they're like, the sun is what gives you life. How consciously are you tracking those two side by side in your storytelling? Not consciously, but, I, but I'm uh, aware of it in this sort of abstract way. But I think there is so much sameness, you know, on both sides of things. You know, when you really start to deconstruct them, you know, the sun being a god and, you know, the sun being a star and the sun being the giver of life, but also the, the ultimate giver of death. Eventually, it's going to destroy us. 
the star as we know it is essentially everything we we want a god to be, except it's it's not sentient, you know, not that we know of. You know, the ideas are kind of the same, even though the the explanations are different. So, you know, science in some ways starts to feel almost just like a very detailed religion with uh, <laughs> that you can cross check and it has math. It's still the same bunch of bullshit at the end of the day. I think you could still sit in a room with a scientist and still get him to a point. At some point, he's going to be like, dude, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I don't know what the cause, I don't know where gravity comes from. What was before the Big Bang? What happened before time? Are we creatures of time? Like what? what's no time? How does that work? How can there really be nothing before something? And if such a question exists, as big a question as that one, doesn't that mean everything we're talking about is probably untrue? I don't know. So I, I find both religion and science to be equally suspect at the end of the day. <laughs> Aaron makes a solid point when discussing his creation of Raised by Wolves Mithraic faith. It's hard to establish a world-spanning religion unless assimilation is your goal. The original cult of Mithras was more interested in involving certain kinds of members stationed throughout specific walks of life and were content to simply meet in their underground temples, it appears. But... It took the hunger of old-school religions like early Catholicism to make the show's Mithraic army the type of powerful and worrisome force that could win a holy war and forge a monopoly on the souls of humanity. Maybe it's not the belief in God, but the rigid trappings behind religion and sometimes behind the covers of Ozzy Osbourne albums that so often leaves us in awe and terror. After all, if the Mithraic in Raised by Wolves just met in caves and drank to the sun, they probably wouldn't be nearly as fascinating. While the real cult of Mithras may be dead, I mean, I hate to break it to you, but you cannot go to a Mithraeum on Sunday and confess your sins to the sun in front of a stone bowl, although that would be interesting, we're lucky to have with us someone who has as close to firsthand knowledge of that sect as possible. David Walsh is a field archaeologist and ancient historian with a PhD from the University of Kent, where he was also a lecturer. David has published several articles about religion in the Roman world with a focus on the rise and disappearance of the cult of Mithras. He's also the host of the podcast Coffee and Circuses, in which he talks to experts on the Roman world. Here's what David had to tell us after studying the Mithraism within Raised by Wolves, which, as it turns out, might have more to do with the take on the religion as romanticized by authors like Rudyard Kipling and Robert E. Howard than it really has to do with the historical version. Right out of the gate, the thing that I want to clear up for myself and I imagine probably our listeners, Mithra, Mithras, Mitra, there are a lot of different monikers that have been connected to this particular piece of history. What is the name that you like to use for that? I suppose my focus is Mithras. It is, as you say, it's a little bit confusing because it tends to vary a bit. There are different versions of deities that perhaps have a common root to them. But Mitra is the Persian deity that is in existence for thousands of years, actually, before Mithras appears on the scene. Mithras, with an S on the end, is the Roman form of that deity, although they look similar. But where that transference from Persia to the Roman world takes place is somewhat of a mystery, really. Will you just also describe to us what the cult of Mithras was and how close it was to the religion that we see in Raised by Wolves, which is obviously to some degree inspired by it? It's fascinating for me to watch because in some respects, there's this strange juxtaposition of watching a cult from the ancient world appear in this very futuristic setting. Although the version that we see in the show obviously is quite different from the one that existed in the Roman world. So to begin with the Roman world, the cult of Mithras, there was all male. It didn't allow females to join, which obviously is a contrast with the series. It existed from around the turn of maybe the first century AD. Somehow the imagery of this young man in a Phrygian cap, as we call it, with the top pulled down, wearing a tunic connected to the sun in some way, as he is in the series, comes across to the Roman world. And then when it's in the Roman world, that image gets combined with this image of him uh, stabbing the ball. And somebody combines that image of this young man with a tunic, with the ball, with some sort of astrological significance. There's celestial bodies do play a role in, in the cult. And actually, 
the temples that people worship Mithras in that we find around the Roman Empire are very similar in their structure. They usually have no windows, it would be very dark. And in that main chamber, you would find a central aisle flanked by two benches. And at the far end, uh, you would see the image of Mithras with the ball, although that might be hidden away and only brought out at particular moments. And there's the argument that actually uh, some of the temples that survive have various images in certain places that relate to the Roman idea of the cosmos. And actually when you walk across a Mithraic temple, you're walking across the, the cosmos. And perhaps it's like the soul rising and descending again in a metaphorical sense. Yeah, we got out of line, so Saul had to punish me. But you know, I'm actually thankful, because it means he loves me, right? Yeah. You know, it's a soul. We're right. just like Mouse. If he sees us doing something naughty... Don't, he's fragile. Huh. You're pretty fragile, too. Aren't you? What? I'm not fragile. Please look at me. See, your mother wants to cuddle you. I tell you the truth, I do too. I don't want to spoil you rotten, but I can't. So it's not gonna take it easy on you. So neither can I. So in Raised by Wolves, Mithraic believers worship the god Sol. Mithra was a sun god himself. So what do we know about the sun god in this particular religion from artifacts of the time? Sol and Mithras are, in the Mithras cult, two separate deities. One of the things I've got to make clear here is that we have no text to go on. Everything that we know about the cult of Mithras comes largely from archaeological evidence. But we often see images of Mithras and Sol as separate entities. So it seems to be almost that where Mithras is stabbing the ball, Sol often appears in that image up in one corner, and then the personification of the moon, Luna, is in the opposite corner. And it seems to be that Sol is telling Mithras to perhaps stab the ball, perhaps kill it, as I say, we don't quite know. And then in subsequent other images, sometimes Mithras and Sol are depicted side by side. There are, I think, images as well of Mithras being taken away on a chariot by Sol. But as I say, they're often depicted as being two separate entities. However, they do sometimes appear in inscriptions with their names being combined. So Mithras is the unconquered son. So there's perhaps an element there where they're separate entities, but also the same at the same time. I know that's a slightly confusing thing to say. I mean, Mithraism itself is, is a word that is actually very misleading. It sounds like something that's akin to Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism that we have this idea about. And then when you look at other cults in the ancient world, we don't have Jupiterism. So Mithraism and Mithraeus, it's a very strange term because also as well, I think it's overly suggestive that the Mithraic initiates were monotheistic and just believed in Mithras alone as their one god where in actual fact they were polytheistic and could worship a variety of deities. Please, Sol, father of fathers, set me free. Do not despise me for my weakness, but grant me the power of your light, so that I may bear your whip and purify this wicked planet. Simply purge these shadows from my sight, and I promise you, I will deliver your judgment. I am your one true servant, and I am ready to receive your power. The followers of the Mithraic religion in the show are hardcore, super devout, willing to die for this, whereas it sounds like uh, the actual cult of Mithras was a little more casual. But we don't know, obviously, because of texts, how much so. Yeah, to be honest with you, there's a lot of uh, parallels that are often drawn with the Freemasons, which do have good reason to them that you have to be initiated to join. It would be quite an intensive ceremony. In order to go through that initiation ceremony as well, you have to kind of put your trust into those around you. You know, you'd probably be stripped naked, your hands bound, you're in a dark room, you're blindfolded, you think you have swords and perhaps torches, bows and arrows pointed in your face, and perhaps you'd actually pretend to die 
basically, once you're initiated into the cult, it's a bunch of guys that know each other. It's very popular with the military um, and also customs officials, which tended to be groups of male imperial slaves that live together. And it's just another kind of level of social bond. So it's almost like a clubhouse, I think. One of the things they seem to eat a lot of in there is cooked chicken uh, <laughs> and young pig and probably drinking quite a lot. This is a little bit of extrapolation that I'm asking you to do, which I'm sure you've considered as an academic. But from what we know, and you as an expert about the cult of Mithras, how much do you think its ideas and its tenets have gotten absorbed and live on in other religions even today? Uh, Well, I guess the place to start with that is the usual portal call where people talk about the close similarities that exist between Christianity and the cult of Mithras. And much of that is actually quite superficial. Uh, The 25th of December is the famous one where people talk about how the Christians stole the 25th of December from the cult of Mithras, that it was Mithras's birthday, and now it's Jesus's birthday. There's actually no evidence for that. And there's also the case with salvation in another life. People talk about that as well, saying Christianity, uh, Mithras have that in common. We don't know that. We don't know if they believed in a Mithraic afterlife. There's never been any Mithraic burials found. Some of the other similarities that people point towards as well, this idea of baptism. Well, the cult of Mithras probably did have a kind of cleansing element to it. We know that one of the Mithraic grades, the lions, would be baptized with fire, but they would actually use honey as a stand-in for that. The worship of the sun is something in Christianity that we see with Sunday and Jesus being the light of the world. And again, Mithras, yes, it has a strong element to it of sun worship, but that is a very common phenomenon. The sun is this celestial life-giving body. So it's always been almost like this focus of, of religious worship. Where there's so much about the cult of Mithras that we don't know, though, because we don't have any texts and a lot of it is extrapolated from archaeology, the fact that it grew up around the time of Christianity, almost perhaps in parallel to some degree chronologically, has allowed people to create these similarities in some respects. And what it's become is it's become a sandbox that people play in to explore certain themes about how religions rise to some extent how they fall and it's almost like a what if with christianity in some ways and raised by wolves is sort of doing that a little bit playing around with this idea of a monotheistic religion based on the sun and it's really interesting how a number of people in various media have taken that and played around with it and in fact the show itself there's a point in it where somebody is reciting a prayer to mithras and they say thou descending a mortal immortal to rise again and that's actually not a an actual mithraic prayer from from the ancient world that's actually a quote from Richard kipling and so you can sort of see almost that there's two cults of mithras that we have now which is one which exists in scholarship and then there's this other mithras which is almost this philosophical explorative uh, subject matter for people in various media that want to discuss aspects of religion but maybe don't always necessarily want to just do a uh, religion that people are part of uh, these days Saul and Raised by Wolves is represented by a star in some cases and five-pointed symbols. While the cult of Mithras had a lot of astrological aspects to it, how much are those ideas kind of that would eventually evolve into astronomy sciences actually part of the worship of Mithras or were they part of it? The temples seem to have some sort of astrological symbolism. It's very rare that the roofs of them survive, although they were intended to be caves. A cave, we're told by ancient philosophers, is a good analogy for the universe because a cave has an inside and not an outside, and it's very dark, and then you can shine a light into it like creation. And in some cases where the roof does survive, we sometimes get uh, small openings which seem to suggest like the passage of the sun. As for whether or not they actually watched the stars and and what role that played in it is very unclear. I would uh, hesitate to suggest too many of them were experts in astrology because, as I say, there's a lot of them that were soldiers, customs officials, merchants as well. But these weren't people that were necessarily, I don't want to say all the time, uneducated, but 
I don't know how much of a role that would have played in terms of their actual knowledge of how that stuff worked. I mean, it's possible that people in the higher grades, there's seven grades of, of initiation, perhaps they might have been given some sort of knowledge that relates to that. But again, it's very unclear. I think it varies probably from place to place in the worship of Mithras. This is a more specific kind of drill down on that question. Anaxagoras was believed to have been the first astronomer to connect the idea that the sun was a star in 5th century BCE, I believe. Did the cult of Mithras or even any of the previous versions that you know of, like the the Persian expression of it, recognize that connection that the sun was also a star? Or were those still two separate concepts? I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating question just in general about what this means to a Mithraic initiate who stands inside the Mithraeum and what they get out of it and what their prior knowledge would actually be. Perhaps there's also a risk of taking too much of it literal in terms of, obviously, we have the sun that moves across the sky and it's, but in terms of actually believing that's physically Mithras or soul moving across the sky and, and how much of this is perhaps figurative in the same way that some people say they're Christian and would not interpret parts of the Bible as being literal, but actually stories that actually have some didactic meaning to them, something that teaches you something. So again, as I said earlier, given the membership that we see with the cult of Mithras, of soldiers, customs officials and the like, um, these don't necessarily strike me as people that would have had a great deal of knowledge about that sort of thing, perhaps people in the higher grade. So it's possible that then the people in the higher grades would also perhaps be more educated as well. So perhaps they would be exposed to ideas to do with astronomy, etc. But I mean, that is kind of freestyling a little bit, really. It's very difficult to say how a Mithraic initiate would have perceived the sun in terms of thinking of it as a star and, and how common that would have been just in general, I think, across the ancient world. Father and I will take care of you from now on. But there is no religion permitted here, Mithraic or any other kind, so before we eat, you will need to give me your appendants. These are weights you no longer need to carry. One of the things that I really, really love about this series is that, right, we have the followers of Mithras in the series, the followers of Saul, who believe that Saul is the life giver, and they've given it, you know, sort of a persona, whereas Mother teaches the children, and the atheist perspective is that the son is responsible scientifically for creating life. So in a way, they're saying the same thing but they're coming at it from completely different ideologies. Were there any overlapping ideologies or cults in the Roman world that had similar ideas to the cult of Mithras, but maybe considered themselves very separate and a a different approach to the idea? There's the cult of Sol Invictus, which obviously shares just Sol with the cult of Mithras, but it's a distinct cult that's something separate. I mean, you have the worship of Apollo, you have the worship of Helios, you have the worship of various solar deities. I mean, arguably, as I say, um, we talk about superficial comparisons. I mean, Christianity is, is in, in essence, in some respects, a, a solar cult as well, you could say. I mean, you have Sunday. But by and large, most people, I think, they probably would have hedge their bets maybe <laughs> and, um, there's a lot of flexibility that exists there and maybe maybe some Mithraic initiates did just believe that, that Mithras was the one true deity but I think by and large most of them were relatively flexible uh, in their beliefs surrounding what was the correct way of, of worship and in terms of who to worship I mean we get statues to other deities uh, appearing in, in Mithraic temples as well it's not purely all the time just Mithras in there which I think relates to perhaps the cult of Mithras surviving into the 4th century when other cults seem to be on the decline a bit earlier. People are perhaps using a Mithraeum as a kind of multifunctional worship space, which often is kind of why people over-exaggerate the competitiveness between that and Christianity. Gotcha. I imagine there were also some people who were like, I'm just here for the chicken. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Definitely all about the chicken. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You mentioned media having sort of its own representation of the cult of Mithras that has really become kind of a separate track from the actual historical cult of Mithras. When you watch something like this, are you picking out all the little elements in the background that relate to your field of study? And do you find that cool? Or are you ever like, oh, cringe, I wish they hadn't used that that way? (laughs) 
I don't find it cringy at all. I'm just like, wow, uh, <laughs> at times. Because as I say, it's, it's a strange juxtaposition. It's very strange to see an object that I've seen so many times in a particular setting to suddenly appear in a setting which is just completely alien. For example, I mean, when they're on the Ark and you see they're talking, I think it's when they're talking to the children and in the background there is an image of Mithras popping out of, we don't know if it's a rock or sometimes it's called the cosmic egg, but he's holding a dagger in one hand and a torch in the other hand and he's surrounded by the signs of the Zodiac. There's, I think, at one point where Mother is kind of having a, a vision into her past and you can see on the floor when she sort of awakens in this vision that the images are taken directly from a Mithraeum at Ostia, which was the port of Rome. And in the center of the Mithraeum down the aisle, it's got these uh, symbols that relate to each of the supposed seven grades. And actually where she appears in that scene, you can see those images on the floor. But as I say, I think for me, it's a case of those things draw my eye to them. Whereas for somebody else, maybe they're there and they're gone in a flash. But I find it fascinating because obviously the work that's gone into the series has kind of brought these bits of iconography in and put them in there. It's almost like Easter eggs to see these things just cropping up in that way, where you just almost you don't expect it in, in some ways. There's one true lion in that big book of bullshit. And so you reap what you sow. We often associate, at least, you know, in the modern era, we think of art as a big part of what religion has contributed to the world. And in Raised by Wolves, we see the Mithraic as being really powerful scientifically as well, right? They have made an ark. They have a necromancer that can kill people with sound. Was the cult of Mithras into science or would they have celebrated it or would they have been a little bit more fearful about it? One of the things I found interesting about the series was it's the religious people and the atheists as separate. But actually, I think as the series progresses, you start to see there's actually quite a lot of overlap and one doesn't really exist without the other. And in the ancient world, we don't really have the secular and the sacred. In some respects, you actually can't really separate science and religion in the ancient world. I think that there's a lot more fluidity that exists between them than perhaps what many people would think nowadays. So in that respect, I think they probably indifferent is probably the best way I could put it. I don't think it would be anti-science, but then I don't know if they would actually have any sort of comprehension of science as being science in that way, because obviously philosophy, um, astrology, all these things are kind of bound up into it as well, which nowadays maybe we would separate out as being separate subjects. But in the ancient world, a lot of this stuff had so much overlap that I don't think you could really say you were anti this and pro that in the same way we would do today. So uh, safe to say, and you've talked about the flexibility of you know, followers of the cult of Mithras as well. So uh, taking into consideration what you've just said as well as that, uh, safe to say that uh, the cult of Mithras, at least the the Roman version of it that you're an expert in, not so much with the idea of a holy war? No, I suppose not. I mean, it's fascinating because when you talk about holy war, as, as I've mentioned, the fact that Mithras was quite popular amongst soldiers. And there's reasons for that that I think are basically sociological which is about you join a particular cohort, for example. You spend all your time with these guys anyway, and the membership of the Mithraic community at your fort is just another level of that. But there is an element there as well, I suppose, of the fact that Mithras is supposedly the unconquered or unconquerable, and soldiers gravitate towards him. So there's probably an element of soldiers going into battle and asking Mithras to protect them. He is a soldier's god in that respect, but in terms of a holy war, not so much. I mean, one of the things that's, again, interesting about the show is there's this traditional narrative of how the cult of Mithras is wiped out by Christianity when that becomes the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. But what the show seems to do is almost take that traditional narrative, but then make the Mithraic initiates the ones that are actually trying to enforce their religious beliefs on others. Does that ever give you concern that popular culture media is is doing things like that and playing a little bit with the historical record in a way that might later confuse people down the road when they talk to you and go, oh, I, I know about Mithras. I saw it on TV. And you're like, no, 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 back up. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that something you enjoy the interplay of more than you worry about the possible misinformation that might might get extrapolated from it? <laughs> 
I subscribe to the idea that entertainment does not have to be historically accurate all the time. I think that you have to allow leeway. When you watch Gladiator, uh, as, as you know, obvious comparative in this situation with the Ridley Scott connection, Gladiator is not exactly 100% historical accurate, but it's a film. It's not designed to be like that. And I don't really mind people taking these things and playing around with them and using them in different ways. I think that's not really necessarily the responsibility of the creator of a show like this or whoever to sit there and go, oh, you know, we need to get it exactly right. The the people watching it, I think, are the people that have to just bear in mind that what you're watching is entertainment and not the actual reality of it. And very rarely do we take things from the past and, and write a fiction book or present a TV series or make a movie which is entirely based on just what happened in the past and an interpretation of that, what we tend to do is take modern issues and mix it in with that. So in a strange way, it's you're looking at the modern world almost through a lens of the past. And that obviously changes over time and it adapts and certain things take on different meanings. And I find that very fascinating, this ongoing dialogue that we have with our past and how we represent our past. And for me, I mean, it's something like, Raised by Wolves is just another interesting chapter of this ongoing evolution of, of Mithras in media. I mean, there's something about particularly Mithras that just seems to have this ongoing appeal. And I, I think probably the mystery elements to it and the perhaps actually is that we don't have the text and so much of it is extrapolation from imagery and from the architecture that's left behind. It creates this kind of open-ended interpretation that people can have and then you can just take it in different directions of, wh of where you want to go with it because you don't have that restriction that you have necessarily perhaps with other cults from the ancient world where we have text. You use their headstones. Is that what they were? The android found them. It doesn't matter. No need to mark the graves of atheists. They're soulless. Undeserving of soul's grace. Are you ready to accept soul into your heart? Or would you prefer to return to the silo? I'm going to ask you a question that's a little more general. Obviously, the setup for this series, Raised by Wolves, is that... Earth has been consumed by a religious war that has destroyed everything. You being an academic who, you know, is an archaeologist and a historian, you are probably very familiar with the phrase that those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Do, do you watch this and think about the fact that we're still, as a species, kind of obsessed with this idea of war and religious war specifically? And do you ever watch something like this and think like, do people not understand that we're doing the same things and we're making the mistakes over and over? Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we have this modern kind of separation of the secular and the sacred and that we look at things like religious wars and religious conflicts as being something in its own bubble. But very rarely do those things actually exist in a vacuum. They are caused by a myriad of other factors behind them. You know, the Crusades is clearly not just simply about uh, retaking the Holy Land. There's obviously political motivations there. There's economic motivation as well. And I think even today, obviously, when we talk about religious extremism and people doing that in our modern world, at least my view on it is that there's systemic problems there that lie much deeper than just simply saying somebody worships this deity and this person worships this deity, ergo, they're going to have a conflict. I think in actually the majority of cases, most people aren't that fussed about it. In fact, in the ancient world, what's always very interesting is that some of the texts allude to people that the likes of clergy get frustrated with because the everyday people just don't see what the problem is by worshipping the Christian deity and other deities. And it's like basically holy men walking around the late Roman Empire being like, no, this is what you should be doing. And the everyday person being a bit more like, uh, really though is it is it such a big deal um <laughs> and i think i think um, that's the case today i think there's a lot of people that aren't really that fussed about it and most people are just kind of happy to let people go about their lives but you know when we talk about say isis which gets confusing because there's the ancient deity isis and then there's the the modern terrorist group isis but that's a group that is not purely religiously motivated there's a right. lot of other factors going on in there and i think as we move forward perhaps you're going to see that drum being banged a lot probably about, you know, religious differences and, and extremism that is going to be, I don't know, necessarily masking, but 
people are going to look at things like that while obviously there are big issues going on like climate change which is probably going to drive the migration of peoples and then that's going to have an impact on the economies and, and things like that and as, as such i think you know religion can often just be a very simplistic way of explaining why people come into conflict when in actual fact there's there's usually a lot more going on behind it that drives that I love that. If you could tell a viewer something that you think, like if they knew this one piece of information or this one interesting fact about the cult of Mithras that would enrich their viewing of Raised by Wolves, what would that be? It's not something that necessarily would make the immediate watching of the show better. But what I would suggest to people is keep your eye out for those Mithraic Easter eggs. And if you ever get the chance, actually try and go see them in person. For example, when you've got that image of Mithras popping out of the rock or the cosmic egg with the zodiac uh, signs around him, you can actually go see that sculpture, like the actual physical sculpture, which is, well, probably about 1,000 800 years old now sat in a museum in Newcastle and I should probably shout out the London one because that's my local one and I've <laughs> things with them. so if you're going to visit one Mithraic temple go see the one in London That'll wrap up this episode of the podcast which has given us plenty of ancient Mithraic esoterica to chew on It's interesting to think that a cult of, well, dudes eating chicken together could be such a threat to the Christians and have such an impact on authors for generations to come. But David's insights and Raised by Wolves commentary are solid reminders of one thing. Any god, no matter how just or widely worshipped, is only as good and powerful as the human beings behind them. Meanwhile, as Raised by Wolves continues to unpack the Mithraic mysteries found on Kepler-22b, you should keep tuning into our show where I will have more experts giving us the inside scoop on the science, technology, and psychology behind Raised by Wolves. Thanks, as always, to Aaron Guzikowski for stopping by, and thank you to David Walsh for offering us his vast knowledge on the cult of Mithras. You can listen to his show on the ancient Roman world, coffee, and circuses wherever you find your podcasts. Raised by Wolves, the podcast is a production of HBO Max and iHeartRadio, hosted by me, Holly Fry. The podcast is produced by Ethan Fixell, written and researched by Chris Crovaton, and engineered, edited, and mixed by James Foster. If you haven't already subscribed, rated, or reviewed Raised by Wolves, the podcast, please do so on the iHeartRadio app, HBO Max, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to watch the series itself on HBO Max, with new episodes available to stream on Thursdays. 